New Year's Eve is typically a joyous occasion, a sign of change, that the old is fading away for new. In Japan, this day is known as Omisoka, one of the most important days of the year. By the turn of this past century, an event occurred that forever marked the holiday season. An entire family in Tokyo was brutally murdered in the comforts of their own home. Okay, so this is by far the most bizarre case I have ever come across because there were so many evidence left by the murderer and yet the police couldn't solve this case. The Miyazawa family were a typical Japanese family. Hikyo Miyazawa, the father, was 44 years old and worked for a London-based marketing firm. He was the kind of guy that got along with everyone. Yasuko Miyazawa, 41 years old, was the wife of Mikyo. She was a teacher described as kind and compassionate. Together, the couple had two children. 8 years old Nina and 6 years old Ray. Nina was a typical kid, playful, fun and enjoyed sports. Ray, however, has a speech impairment, causing the family a fair amount of stress. The family lived in Setagaya, the second largest district in Tokyo. Their home was a shared building split into two. On the outside, it looks like one big apartment but it's more so for duplex. They stayed in one apartment in the building and their neighbours were actually Yasuko's mother, sister and brother-in-law. To get to the other house, however, they have to exit the front door and enter through another door. So there was no internal connection between the houses. One important note is that right behind the house, there's actually a park. This park had been there for years, but the city had been planning on expanding it, meaning that most of Miyazawa's neighbours had been moving out in the recent months in order to make way for expansion. In this neighbourhood, there were only four families, the Miyazawas, their relatives next door, and two other families that lived on their street. The busiest part of the area was a skate park that was right behind the Miyazawa family home, separated only by a fence. In this week leading up to New Year's Eve, Miku actually confronted a group of loud teenagers for making too much noise at the skate park. A witness reported seeing him confront a group of young rebels that belonged to a Japanese motorcycle gang. A few months prior, during summer, the community noticed that some of the area's animals had been physically tormented. There were rumours that dead rodents had been found and even stray cats were tortured. On December 25th, on Christmas, Yasuko mentioned to her father-in-law that a strange car had been parking in front of their house. There were other parkings available that's not right in front of the house, so it was weird to Yasuko that this stranger was just parking his car in front of their house as though like he was stalking them. Two days later, on the 27th, a man estimated to be in his 40s was seen walking around the Miyazawa family home by an eyewitness. Initially, it seemed seemed innocent because people could be in the neighbourhood for various reasons like maybe they could have just visited the other apartments that were living down the streets but in hindsight it looks kind of suspicious. On December 29th, a man was spotted in a nearby train station a few miles away from the Miyazawa home. He was wearing a skater type of outfit with a backpack which the eyewitness thought it was odd since it was winter and he looked very underdressed. On the same day, the police believed that a man matching this description purchased a sashimi knife from the same shopping area. It was also the only knife purchased at this supermarket on this day, so it was easy to trace. Keep in mind this sashimi knife and this skate outfit because it will all come into play later. On December 30th, a man matching the same description was spotted near Sengawa station roughly a mile away from the Miyazawa home. He was estimated to be roughly 35 to 40 years old. 30th of December, who marked the last day for the entire Miyazawa family. It was a relative normal morning for the family. They were going about their daily business and preparing for the upcoming holidays. Sometime in the early evening, around 6pm, the family allegedly went shopping. An eyewitness recalled seeing them at a nearby shopping centre at around that time. Also, a neighbour who drove by their house that evening recalled seeing the family car missing at around 6.30pm as well, giving credibility to the source. At around 7pm, there was a phone call between Yasuko and her mother. The families often used the phone to speak to one another instead of going over to each other's place. Nothing was suspicious about the call. And since Nina went over to her grandmother's house next door until 9.30pm, it was probably a call from Yasuko to ask her mom if her daughter could come over and play. The last recorded activity of the Miyazawa family was an access email which was read around 1038 that evening. It was Mikio reading a work email which was password protected, meaning that he was likely personally responsible for opening it. And that was the last moment known that at least one of the members of the Miyazawa family was alive. There were three signs that something was amiss that night. Number 1. Around 10pm, a witness walking along the park path behind the Miyazawa house heard what sounded like an argument taking place inside of the house. Number 2. Around 11.30pm, almost an hour and a half later, a member of the Yasuko family next door heard loud banging sounds coming from the Miyazawa side of the building. Number 3. 
an eyewitness recalled seeing a man hurrying along the walking path that travelled next to the family house. Within the close proximity of the Miyazawa house, a taxi driver was picking up three passengers. They were very quiet throughout their journey. One of the men had a wound on him and left a blood stain on the back seat of the cab. The next morning on New Year's Eve, Tetsuko's mother tried calling her daughter's family to make plans for later that afternoon. Her call couldn't go through. The phone line in the Miyazawa family home was cut, purposefully disconnected by someone hours beforehand. Yasuko's mother found it weird and decided to walk over to their house. She rang the doorbell. No answer. She then used her own set of keys to let herself in. The house was silent. As she walked in, she saw the body of Mikio Miyazawa at the bottom of the staircase. The 44-year-old father of the family had been stabbed multiple times and was lying lifeless at the bottom of the staircase leading up to the second story. Yasuko's mother recalls going up to the second story to try and see what had happened to the rest of the family. Immediately at the top of the stairs, she found bodies of her daughter, Yasuko, and her granddaughter, Nina, both who had been stabbed dozens of times more brutally than Mikyo. In the nearby bedroom lay six-year-old Ray, still in bed, dead. At the scene, the police began looking at the crime and pieced together what had happened. Yasuko's mother, sister and brother-in-law, who had all been next door when the crime occurred, tried to recall anything that was odd or suspicious that happened. The only thing that struck the bell for them was a loud touch that had occurred around 11.30 that evening. Due to the wounds on his body, the police believed that Mikio actually fought with the killer and then the killer eventually, you know, stabbed him multiple times and then just threw him to the bottom of the staircase, hence the touch. So remember I mentioned about this sashimi knife that a man bought a day earlier? That was actually the same exact knife used by the killer. A little thing that the police found weird is that Mikio was still in his business attire and not his home clothes, which is not too alarming I would say. I mean like sometimes when I come home from school, I will just use my laptop first and then shower. So it's not that big of a deal. Before I talk about the bodies of Yasuko and Nina, let me quickly show you the layout of the family home. The house was built in a way that at the top of the stairs leading up to the second story, there was a ladder leading up to the third story loft which had a bed and a television. Many people assumed that Yasuko and Nina were up there at the time of the murder, watching television and perhaps lying down in bed. The bodies of both Yasuko and Nina were found at the bottom of the ladder leading up to the third story loft. Their stab wounds were excessive and both victims were stabbed well beyond their point of death. This led to many theories that the killer hated girls, hated women, or had at least some sort of aggression against the female gender. The family's son, Ray, was found in bed strangled. Initially, police were perplexed like why was Ray the only one being strangled instead of being stabbed? But after that, they assumed that Ray was probably the first one to get killed. That same afternoon, roughly six hours later after the bodies had been discovered, a young man was admitted to a medical centre in Tobu Niko Station, a few hours away from the Miyazawa home. This man, in his 30s, was admitted without giving up his name or the reason for his injury. So how the staff remember this was because this guy was very nonchalant at the centre, like he wasn't faced by his injury. He was very calm, so they found it very weird because the wound was so deep. This guy was wearing a black down jacket with jeans and was released after being treated. The crime scene was full! Full, I mean like full of evidence. Both murder weapons were left behind. Two knives, the one purchased on the 29th, and the other one was one of Miyazawa's kitchen knives. Both were found in the kitchen with blood on them. The family's first aid kit had been opened, and it had Nina's blood on them. Okay, this is where it gets really disgusting, because in the upstairs bathroom, the killer actually left like unflushed feces. So he took a shit in the family home and he didn't flush, which was quite ballsy of him. Like, it's all DNA, right? I mean, it's either he's overconfident that he'll never get caught or he's just dumb. Analysts discover remnants of a sesame spinach dish containing shrimp beans. This was somewhat of a boring dish, like a type that your mom would feed to you. So like a lot of people will speculate that maybe this guy was still living with his mother. All over the house were blood stains and dirty footprints of the killer. These shoe prints belonged to a specific type of brand which was available all over Japan but the shoe print left behind was of a very specific size that was not found in Japan. It was a Korean shoe size and could only be found in Korea. Towels were also found with unknown blood on them. This supported the theory of Mikio fighting with the attacker because he most likely injured the attacker so much so that the attacker had to tend to his wounds using the towels and therefore leaving blood on the towels. Okay, so this is like the most mind-boggling part of the investigation because the killer actually left 
all his personal belongings, his clothes that he brought into the house and he just left it there. This is the full outfit the killer wore to the crime scene. A grey crusher hat, one black tag jacket, a white and purple long sleeve shirt, black air wing gloves, a multicoloured scarf with no tags, and a black handkerchief. The handkerchief was also noteworthy because it was iron prior to use, which supported this theory of how like this killer had a motherly figure because even I feel like it's too troublesome <laughs> if I were to iron a handkerchief. All the clothing items were found to have been washed in hot water, meaning that the water used to clean the clothing was full of minerals and vitamins, not usually found in regular occurring water. You can usually taste the minerals in hard water, whereas soft water is a little more flat and can sometimes taste salty. Japan uses a soft water system. Korea, however, uses a hot water system. The killer also left behind a hip bag. Inside, there was a piece of grip tape used for surface of skateboards. The last piece of evidence was the most bizarre and that was sand. There were like sand in the bag. Forensic analysts determined that the sand was from the southern western United States, around the Edwards Air Force Base. This led yet to another theory, and that the killer was perhaps an airman stationed in Tokyo, or even a type of contractor that did business in multiple countries. Despite all of this evidence, the police couldn't piece the case together nor come up with the suspect. Even though there were multiple clothings left behind by the killer, they were so common that thousands of each had been sold in Japan in each year. So tracking down every owner of the clothing didn't make sense. After further police investigations, working out evidences and testing the forensics, the police managed to detail a series of events that led to the family being murdered. The second bathroom window of the Miyazawa home was accessible to the back of the house and located just above the fence, separating the house from the park, which was most likely how the killer had entered the house. After breaking into the house, Police suspect that 6-year-old Ray was the first to be killed and was strangled in his sleep. From there, the detective presumed that Mikyo was downstairs working on his computer and was distracted by some noise upstairs and while walking up the stairs, he came face to face with the killer. A scuffle ensued, ending with Mikyo hitting the bottom of the stairs. Yasuko and Nina were next. They were either attacked upstairs in the third floor loft or at the foot of the ladder. Remember the first aid kit that has Nina's blood on it? The detective's theory is that he attacked them with this broken sashimi knife, possibly broken because like he fought with Mikio before. He realized it was not usable on Nina and Yasuko, so he left to the kitchen to take another knife. The detectives believe that the mother and daughter probably thought that the killer gave up and just ran away, so they decided to treat Nina's wound with the first aid kit, hence there was blood on the first aid kit. Usually you know how the killer will just flee the scene so that he won't get caught, this killer stayed for hours after he even took a nap. He helped himself to ice cream from the family's fridge, he even left behind wrappers with his fingerprints on them. The killer had also used the family's computer located at the study. The computer was accessed in the early mornings of December 31st, once at 1.18am and the second time at 10.05am in the morning. People presumed that the killer wanted to relish being in the intimacy of their home. Throughout the night, the killer compiled family's ID and credit cards all sorted in the living room nearby by the sofa he slept in. Before leaving, he also gathered an odd variety of the family's belongings and garbage and put them in a bathtub. It was a mixture of garbage like ice cream wrappers, cut up advertising leaflets, some of Miko's work receipts, Yasuko's school documents along with feminine sanitary items that contained the killer's blood. Zero idea on why the killer left it there but many people say that maybe he wanted to do something with it, maybe burn it, like soak it in water but he just forgot about it. Over the years, there were no new leads until 2006 due to the advancement of forensic testing. Using the blood left on the towers at the scene, DNA tests show that the killer was mixed race and probably not a Japanese citizen. His parents had belonged to two varying cultures, Eastern Asian and Southern European. He stands about 175cm tall, wore a Korean specific size shoe of 27.5cm and also have a blood type A. There were also major inconsistencies about this case. There were rumours that there was not one but three men present at the house that night. Earlier in my video, I mentioned about a taxi driver who picked up three suspicious men at the night of the mass murder, leaving behind a blood stain. Reports hinted that they were trying to test their blood with the evidence left behind at the scene, but it's been years and there were no words on whether or not it matched up with anything, so we can all assume it was a false lead. It's been 20 years since and this case remained unsolved. Personally, I don't think this killer is in Japan anymore. He probably left the country. I would love to know what you guys think in the comments. Let me know. Please subscribe. See you in the next one. Bye. So he left the kitchen. So he left the...
So he left to the kitchen and fetched one of their houses 